Thank you very much, uh, friends of Cardiac Surgery, to in invite me. Dear friends, uh, colleagues, students, residents, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I didn't pioneer the minimally invasive at all. I don't know who came up with this. I, I don't even do minimally invasive that much. But I do complex cardiac surgeries, and I'll give you the gist of uh, what I do, actually, and I'll, I'll let you know exactly what I do. So the topic that was given to me was the art of uh, arterial revascularization in coronary artery bypass grafting. For years, for decades, everybody has known that internal memory artery to the LAD is the best graft that you can give uh, in a cabbage. However, what about the second arterial graft? Time and again, it's been proven that the second arterial graft or the third arterial graft is actually better. But how is it possible that 90% of the world still follows internal memory artery and two or three vein grafts or four vein grafts uh, in a cabbage patient? So why is it that only 10% of the people have followed that through? That's the reality, maybe slightly more. But what we need to understand is the reason that has happened is because of the technical expertise that is required, not that much, but to some extent, and that is why this whole seminar is, uh, is arranged for you. So in this presentation, I will present to you about the art of arterial revascularization, which is hardly anything. So I have no disclosures. I'm not connected to anyone, except I am a full-time faculty at AKU. So as far as the coronary artery bypass graftings are concerned in arterial, uh, as far as the arterial conduits are concerned, there are four arterial conduits. One is the left internal thoracic artery. One is the right internal thoracic artery. All of you know about it. One is the radial artery from the non-dominant arm. You can use both radial arteries also. And one is the gastroepiploic artery, which I have never personally used, but I've seen it being used. And Far East uh, uses a lot. The West population don't use gastroepiploic that much. So I will just go over briefly about this for the students. The left internal thoracic artery, or the lima, and the right internal thoracic artery basically are two arteries coming out from the first portion of the subclavian artery. And uh, as they come down uh, in, uh, at the inner wall of the chest, they supply the blood supply to the, to the intercostal vessels. You harvest the right internal thoracic artery. You guys all know about it. If anybody has gone into open heart surgeries, probably that's the first thing that they would see. Put up a chevalier and take out the right internal, uh, left internal thoracic artery. The same thing, the same chevalier in a different fashion will be used to harvest the right internal thoracic artery. The right internal thoracic artery, ka sirf, the one thing which is important is, in this area, the phrenic nerve is very close. In this area, the phrenic nerve is a little far apart. But if you are not careful, you will goon the phrenic nerve in this area. And that's why when you're harvesting the right internal thoracic artery, you have to be careful about this. Uh, as far as the radial artery is concerned, we use the non-dominant arm in our practice, but everybody uses the non-dominant arm. The first thing you have to do is, you have to use the Allen's test, which is basically to figure it out whether the ulnar artery is also supplying the palm or not. That's the gist about it. So the way to do it is through an old-fashioned technique by pressing both of them and releasing one at a time and figuring out whether the palm are uh, arches are filling up with the blood, or you can use a simple plethysmograph with a, RT, uh, with a blood saturation monitor and see the plethysmograph and look at the arterial monitor and see it. So you do it like this. We do it the same way in AKU also. And we harvest the radial artery in the same fashion, the anatomy, I'm not gonna go over that anatomy, you can look at it on the YouTube or into the, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the books. But basically, the radial artery comes off like this. It has a median nerve very close here. So when you're using the, to dissect, don't use the bovi here. Otherwise, you will injure the median nerve on that left-hand side or on the right if you are doing it close. And then there is a cutaneous nerve, which is right here. If you injure that cutaneous nerve, they have paresthesias. So you don't want to do this. But to harvest the radial artery is very, very, very straightforward. You, 
see it a couple of times, you try to do it a few times, and all our residents, almost all our residents above second year level, they know how to harvest the radial artery. And uh, so this is basically the radial artery, and you, uh, we use titanium clips to, uh, to clip all the branches, you can tie them, and we don't skeletonize this too much, but uh, we harvest this with the veni comitente, which are uh, around the radial arteries. And we harvest it along the entire length, which is good enough to even go up to the PDA or to the PLV, if you're doing it directly. Then there is a gastroepiploic, though I have only seen them, I have never done them, but the Far East, I said, Vietnam, Korea, they do a lot of these. So you harvest this gastroepiploic, and you use the same brand, the celiac trunk, uh, to supply this blood, and you put this through the diaphragm and use that to bypass the PDA usually. But this is something which is unusual, and most of you probably may never see it, except on the YouTube. So before I go into actual techniques of arterial revascularization, the art of arterial revascularization, there are a few things that every single person in this, in this uh, group, the audience should know about, that there are certain rules, okay? One is the competitive flow. When you're putting in a vein graft, and if there is a more than 50, everybody knows that if you have a more than 50% diameter, which is occluded, it's a significant coronary artery occlusion, okay? Or 75% cross-sectional area, but 50% more. Less than 50%, there's no change in flow. It's the law of physics, but more than 50%. But if you put in an arterial graft, which is about sick on, a, on, an artery, on an artery, of any artery, which is about 60, 70%, there's so much of a competitive flow that you will end up with, uh, with, uh, with an occlusion, or with a, with a, that graph will go down. Uh, the FFR measurements are usually there. They can actually measure it, but we don't F FFR everyone. FFR only are done on equivocal lesions. So unless FFR is done on every lesion, you have a competitive flow risk. So if you are putting in an arterial graft, which is less than 70% occluded on visualization, don't do it, okay? That's one of the dictums about uh, this. If you have to do it, if you have to do it, then use the internal thoracic artery versus right uh, radial artery. It's, I, I personally don't believe in it, but it is said that the internal memory artery will have a far better resistance to competitive flow than the radial artery. Our, internal memory arteries in this part of the world, in South Asia, in Southeast Asia, you have seen our internal memory arteries are not like Caucasians or Afghanis. Our internal memory arteries are smaller, especially in women. So I would argue about this, but I can tell you that the competitive flow risk is there and one should, before thinking about putting in an arterial graft, think about this, what kind of a lesion it is, it is significant enough or not. The second thing is about the age. Should we put it only in younger age group or should we put it in all age groups? So when we started out at AKU, we started putting in everybody who is under 50. As I crossed 50, I thought that 50 is not young anymore. 50, maybe 60, under 60 is young. So we start putting in under 60. Now we put it on everyone. So if you have an older person, it's not necessary that you can't put it in you can put in, in an arterial graft in everyone, though arterial grafts are favored in under 60, 70 years of age. But if you have an, somebody who can take out the radial artery in 15 minutes, if you have somebody who uh, can harvest it while you are harvesting the internal memory artery, this artery is actually much better in all age groups. So the age is not a determinant that you should not be doing an arterial graft. However, it is preferred if you have a younger age group. Uh, in terms of elderly, the, I would say you try to use it more often, especially if you are putting in a T graft or a Y graft, because then you have lesser uh, injury or lesser, uh, you, you would not be using uh, the aorta to actually put in the proximal vein graft. So it's actually benefit it benefits the elderly also because of that reason. So the age is not the reason. People argue about it should be put in only in younger age group. Say, 
no longer, because we would like to put it in everyone. Then, uh, how do you, what, what are the risk factors? So when you are putting the internal thoracic artery on one side, the left side, when you're using the right one also, or the second IT versus right, uh, versus the radial artery, evaluate the risk of mediastinitis. If you are harvesting both internal memory arteries from either side, the risk of mediastinitis is definitely there. It's a finite, small risk, but it is there, especially in the ones when you have not skeletonized those vessels. So what are the risks are? Are diabetes, obesity, female gender, COPDers, and somebody who is on immunosuppressive agents that is there. So try not to use in those in the second internal memory artery. However, in diabetics, it is not a very significant factor. You can still use uh, the second internal thoracic artery, especially in younger population. And the heightened risk factors are if you have, uh, if you have not used the skeletonized ones. So, so that is where you have to remember all this. What is the other one is increasing utilization, but to increase the utilization of arterial grafts. Remember one arterial graft, internal thoracic artery is there. Let's say you want to use a radial artery and you want to use the radial artery to graft the OM1 and OM2. So you can use the radial artery as a T graft and use it onto the inside too. Or you use the right internal memory artery as a free graft and use it as a, as, a, as a sequential graft. So that is where you can increase the utilization. So like just take one artery and put in a T graft, so it, it's as simple as that. Before going on the pump, so if you have done this in astomosis before on the going on the pump, you have reduced the uh, pump time also. Uh, one other thing is try to use a T graft versus Y. So the T graft is coming in perpendicular. The radial artery or the internal memory artery, the right internal memory artery is a free graft coming out perpendicular. You can put in a vein graft all to onto it also. The T grafts work out far better than the Y grafts. Why is that? Because the Y graft sometimes you have made it a slightly longer, they will uh, have a little curve or kink or they are coming in at an angle and it creates atherosclerosis far more. And that is why the T grafts work out far better than the Y grafts. Uh, the use of multiple arterial grafts are of, obviously, then they will be of a benefit. So if somebody can harvest one radial artery, they can harvest the other radial artery. If one can harvest the internal memory artery in maybe less than 10 minutes, it will only take you another 10 minutes and you have no proximal anastomosis, you have a beautiful graft. So try to do this and then you have to make sure at the end that all your arterial grafts are working. If you have put in an arterial graft as a showpiece, saying that I have used the radial artery and you have damaged the radial artery or it has thrombosed or you have put in an anastomosis, which is not perfect, or you have put in a second internal memory artery, right internal memory artery, and anastomosed it to the radial artery so that it can go distally, and that anastomosis is kinked, it's of no value, rather than you should just do a simple vein graft. At least you will have an, a live patient. So you have to make sure that the graft is patent at the end. With all these dictums, with all of this knowledge, then we proceed towards operative strategies. What are the different operative strategies in arterial grafting? Now remember, competitive flow is the key. How you have harvested those vessels is the key. How you have put those vessels, anastomose them is the key. And if you know how to anastomose a vein graft, you can easily anastomose the arterial graft. Uh, the first strategy is, which is the easiest strategy is, which is the most common strategy, which we have used at, at times also, is you put in the right, the left internal memory artery to the obtuse marginal, to the, excuse me, to the OM1, OM2, or ramus intermedius. Make sure that the blockage here is more than 70%. If the blockage is less than 70%, putting in this graft is of no value. So this is the dictum which I have to follow. So left internal memory artery to the obtuse marginal and the right internal memory artery to the, inter, uh, to the LAD. 
Now, the only drawback about this is when you are doing a redo surgery, the right internal thoracic artery will be right in the middle. So you just have to be careful. You have to go on the pump before opening the chest and so that not to injure this if it is patent. But irrespective, this is the easiest one. Why is it easiest? Because you can use this as an off-pump strategy also. It's the easiest off-pump strategy is to use this without touching the uh, aorta. The second strategy is, is you use the left internal thoracic artery to the obtuse marginal and use a T graft or a Y graft of the right internal thoracic artery, which you have used as a free graft. You can use this as a radial artery also and put this into the LAD. I would not use the uh, radial artery onto the LAD because it's not proven. This, these grafts have not proven whether the radial artery will last as much as the internal memory artery. So I would use the right internal thoracic artery, put in a T graft to the left internal memory artery, and sew it perfectly, make sure that the anastomosis is wide open, and put this into the, right, uh, into the LED and put this one directly into the obtuse marginal. The benefit of this is you don't have to go all the way to the phrenic nerve where you can injure it. And you can only use two thirds of, uh, of the internal uh, memory artery on the right side and use this as a Y graft. The third strategy is you use composite sequential right internal thoracic artery from Lita. So you have a lesion in the diagonal also, all right? And you want to use all total arterial revascularization. Instead of using a vein graft here, and let's say that uh, stenosis here and here was not much. The stenosis here was more than 80, 90%, but between the diagonal and the LED is about 60%. So you don't want to put in a vein graft here and then you have a uh, competitive flow between this and this. So you can put in the left internal memory artery into obtuse marginal and use a Y graft coming out from the internal memory artery, coming in into the LED here. But before doing this, put in a sequential graft to one of the diagonals or even to ramus intermedius here and put in this. So you have used two internal thoracic arteries and you have been able to put both of them into this. It may, it's, it's, if you know how to sew, you know how to use the castro and the needle holder and the needle. It's straightforward. It will take you some few minutes extra, but it doesn't take you that long. But that's, that's what it is. Uh, then you have the composite right internal thoracic artery coming out let, uh, on lateral side with an additional T graft. So the, this one is instead of using the right internal thoracic artery, many people use the radial artery. So what you do is you have the internal thoracic artery coming in into the LED, which is the lima coming into the LED, and you have put in a T graft either the right internal thoracic artery, the free graft, or the radial artery, which is the most common. And use that radial artery to go all the way rapid to the back. So you have put in OM1, and even the PLV, or even the PDA. PDA is coming then from the radial artery com coming in uh, from the left side. Instead of coming from the right side, it's coming out from the left side. So the radial artery will go into, the, uh, into OM1 and the PDA. The only drawback about this one is, you have put all your eggs in one basket. And I personally don't, uh, uh, I, I, would not, uh, I, I would not be able to tell you that I do this because I, I don't like this. But I would put in one graft more. If I have to do this, I would put in a radial artery into obtuse marginal, but I would not use it to put in about two or three grafts. And you have used this entire thing on this internal memory artery. I've tried one internal memory artery to put in a T graft into a young patient who had a left main 90% stenosis. So, but there was no stenosis beyond that. I put this internal memory artery into LED and put in the radial artery into the obtuse marginal. There were only two grafts needed. That patient was not coming off the bypass for whatever reason. I think the internal memory artery flow was not enough to, uh, to take care of two, uh, the lateral and posterior territories as well as the interior. So I, have, I don't do this unless and until you have a left main or you have disease in these both of these together. I don't want a competitive flow in any one of them. 
So that's, that's another one. And then you have uh, the internal, uh, left internal thoracic artery to the LAD, uh, which is the lemur to the LAD. And right internal thoracic artery, you go in the transverse sinus. You, you know, if you can put in a clamp, the right angle, behind the pulmonary artery, or posterior to the pulmonary artery and the aorta, you have this transverse sinus. You put this behind it and put this into the obtuse marginal. I personally don't do this. I am always uh, wary of the fact that sometimes I'll be worried about that what if this gets occluded or gets, uh, gets compressed. So I have not tried this, but people have portrayed this, voila, this, this thing also and doing this, and many people do it all the time. And the one that we use the most common is the radial artery to the posterior descending artery. The radial artery coming in into the posterior descending artery. I use it very often. Any uh, time I have, I, I just harvest an isolated radial artery and I want to do it fast enough, I put the radial artery into the PDA. And that's something which I do the, the most. The other one is in situ reta with extension into the uh, radial artery. I have seen it, I have not personally done it, but people do it all the time is, you use the internal thoracic artery and anastomose with the radial artery and then you put it into the PDA. I personally don't recommend this because this one gets an uh, uh, stenose very quickly and gets fibrosis. So you would rather use this as a free graft coming out from there and putting it into the LED through right internal thoracic artery. So these are the few techniques. And then the last one is the gastroepiploic coming into the PDA and uh, coming out from uh, the diaphragm into this. All of this sounds kind of novel to most of you because you guys have not seen the radial arteries or the uh, left internal thoracic artery with the radial artery or the right internal thoracic arteries very often. Most of you have seen the venous grafts. But if you know how to sew a venous graft to any vessel in the, in the heart, and especially in this population in Pakistan, which have small vessels, less than 1.5 millimeter, 1.25 millimeter, you can easily sew the arterial grafts. What it requires is, is this meticulous approach, expertise, and what I always say, thodi si himmat. And with this, I thank you. <laughs>